Merry Christmas! Good morning, and Merry Christmas to you all. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we enter this Christmas season, may we just be truly thankful for the great gift that you had given us 2,000 years ago, being your son in that manger. As we celebrate his birth, may we just keep a focus on the reason for the season, and that's the great love and the sacrifice that you made, that he made, Lord, to uh, alleviate of us our sins and to prepare a place for us in heaven for all those who would trust in him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's take our hymnals and turn to page number 184. The song is Hark the Herald Angels Sing, number 184. Glory to the newborn King, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies, with angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Christ by highest heaven adored, Christ the everlasting Lord. Late in time, behold him come, offspring of a virgin's womb, veiled in flesh, a Godhead see, held the incarnate deity, pleased as men with men to dwell, Jesus of Emmanuel, hark the herald angels sing, glory. 
Oh, bring me to the newborn King. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all He brings. Risen with He, ring in His wings. Mount He lays His glory by. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them second birth. Hark the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King. What a wonderful song that is. Amen to that. Our unison reading today comes from the Gospel of Luke. It's a very familiar uh, passage, especially if you only go to church on Christmas. It's a very familiar passage. Luke chapter 1, verses 28 through 31. I'm going to invite Mike Spina to the pulpit to lead us in this reading. And the rest of you, please stand if you're comfortable. Stand. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing with the reading of his word, and you may be seated. This morning we're going to talk, to talk about a young lady who lived some 2,000 years ago. You're probably ahead of me. Her name is Mary. Now Luke 1, tells us that God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth in Galilee to visit this same Mary. And of course we have hindsight to know why Gabriel is dropping in on Mary unannounced. We know that he has some mighty big news for Mary and we'll get to that news in just a few minutes. Now if you've been a, a Christian as long as I have and some of you maybe even longer, you've seen Gabriel delivering his message to Mary depicted in various ways in movies, in coloring books, and on Christmas cards. Sometimes Mary is outside at a well or sitting alone in a meadow. Sometimes she's inside sweeping the floor or performing some other household chore. We aren't told exactly what Mary is doing when Gabriel drops in on her unannounced. All we are for certain is that Mary is apparently all alone when he comes to visit. Likewise, I've seen Gabriel depicted in differing ways. Sometimes he looks like a, just a regular man dressed in white standing in front of Mary. I've also seen him basking, basked in glowing light, uh, hovering three feet off the floor. Uh, sometimes Gabriel is portrayed with wings and a halo, sometimes not. Does Gabriel come through the door or does he just appear in the room? We're not told. But anyway, all we know for certain is that Gabriel appears and abruptly speaks to Mary. He says, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. The Bible then tells us that Mary sees him and she is troubled at his saying and cast in her, her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And that's a very good question. What manner of salutation is this, by the way? Most people just say, good morning, hello, can I talk to you for a few moments? It's not very often that a stranger just appears and says, uh, Hi there, you need to know that out of all the other women in the world, the Lord has chosen you. He's approved of you and believe you me, this is a good thing. This salutation is not only awkward, the Bible says it troubles Mary. Gabriel's words along with his just sudden appearance frightens Mary. And knowing this, the angel tells Mary to fear not. This is not the first time we've seen this in the Bible. Anytime an angel in all its glory or any heavenly being in all their glory appears to one of us sinners, that angel has to say, fear not, because our sin makes us afraid. When we get to heaven, we won't be afraid of the angels. 
That would be terrible, wouldn't it? Every time, you'd be living in constant fear. But here on earth, because we're in our human mortal form, we fear that which is righteous and godly. But anyway, um, she's frightened. And Mary, uh, Gabriel wastes no time. He tells her to fear not. He wastes no time making the announcement that he has come all the way from heaven to make. He tells Mary that she is with child. Now in my day, when I was little, there were only two ways to tell people that you were with child and they both included animals you either told them that the stork was making a delivery or that the rabbit died how many of you remember that nobody says that anymore back to our story though verse 30 and the angel said unto her fear not mary for thou hast found favor with god and behold thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name jesus he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom there shall be no end. And I almost picture Mary saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, back up a little bit. You buried the headline there. You know, Mary seems to push aside all that Messiah stuff. That Jacob and David stuff is all very well and good. But Mary knows how biology works. She, she's, okay, okay, Angel Gabriel, take this back a click. How can this pregnancy be when I know not a man? And of, 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 I mean, of course she knows a man. His name is Joseph, and the two of them are planning to marry. But she doesn't know him, know him, if you know what I mean. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Gabriel tells Mary that her baby will come special delivery. No mortal man will be necessary in this process. Mary will be enveloped by the Holy Ghost. This will result in her pregnancy, and the baby will be and is the son of God. Gabriel then tells Mary that about her much older cousin Elizabeth, who is at this very time that Gabriel's talking to Mary, Elizabeth is six months with child. Elizabeth too is going to have a son, and this is also very incredible news because Elizabeth thought she was barren. You see, six months earlier, before this fateful uh, day that Gabriel visits Mary, Gabriel made a very similar visit to a priest named Zacharias. While Zacharias is fulfilling his duties in the temple, Gabriel appears and tells Zacharias that his wife Elizabeth will be visited by the stork or the rabbit will die or whatever he says. In other words, his wife is going to have a baby. It's going to be a son. That son will grow up to be John the Baptist. John the Baptist would be the, would be the forerunner of his yet-to-be-born cousin Jesus. And Jesus would be the Christ the promised Messiah. There's a lot of similarities between Elizabeth's news and Mary's news. Number one, neither one has to guess what the child's going to be. In a day before gender reveal parties and, and sonograms, these, the angel Gabriel tells them, you're going to have a son. You're going to have a son. Your son's going to be named John. Your son's going to be named Jesus. That's half the battle. You know to paint the room blue, right? <laughs> You know that J is, is going to be on... Anyway, let's just go on. Anyway. Zacharias, however, was in disbelief. He didn't believe like Mary did. So Gabriel announces that Zacharias would be, not be able to speak until his son John the Baptist is born. Now, who among us would not disbelieve like Zacharias did? Uh, but consider this, although Elizabeth's condition is astonishing being that she is well beyond her childbearing years, it's not quite the miracle that Mary's condition is, is it? Because Elizabeth knows a man, her husband Zacharias. Anyway, Gabriel wraps things up with Mary, excuse me, and his last words to Mary are, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Truer words have never been spoken. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Mary then accepts her role as the mother of the Messiah. And Mary, verse 38 tells us, said, Behold thy, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel, he departs from her. As quick as he had shown up, he disappears. Wow. This happens, right? Two babies 
in one family. Two unexpected expecting mothers, each with a visit from an angel, no less. After Gabriel's announcement, I'm sure Mary doesn't know which way to turn. She no doubt is scared, confused, and withdrawn. But even so, I think she's also excited. I do. She was visited by an angel. She's about to give birth to the Christ child. How could she not be excited? Seemingly, with nowhere else to turn, Mary goes to stay with her older cousin Elizabeth, whom Gabriel had mentioned. And maybe that's why Gabriel told her the news about Elizabeth, so that she would have a place to kind of hide out for a while and process what's going on. Now think of it, these two, Mary goes to see Elizabeth, these two expectant cousins coming together, the first with an unlikely pregnancy, the other with an absolutely impossible pregnancy, but as the angel told Mary, for with God nothing shall be impossible. Both women have something else in common. Each decides on their own and separately, at least for the time being, to hide her pregnancy. At first, neither lady tells anyone. Elizabeth keeps quiet because she's worried that some may, make, some may make fun of her because she's older. They may even ridicule her. And why, you know, anybody would have an opinion about this? Ugh. People have never changed. Everyone has an opinion about everything. But anyway. Now, Mary keeps quiet because she doesn't want to be made a public example or yet be punished for her apparent sin, which she didn't sin, but apparently that's what people would jump to as a conclusion. But what a shame that both women have to keep their joy to themselves for fear of what the neighbors will think or what the neighbors will do. At least Elizabeth is married. Mary is not. You know, having children outside of marriage is frowned upon during this time in our history. If word gets out, Mary's fiancé Joseph could honestly say, well, Mary and I have never been intimate, so he would have to just conclude, along with his whole family and all the neighbors, that Mary had been unfaithful to Joseph. This would be a greatly punishable deed, perhaps even with Mary's death. Now, the two women come together. Mary knows about Elizabeth's condition because Gabriel told her, but Elizabeth knows nothing of Mary. But as soon as Elizabeth hears Mary's voice, Elizabeth's unborn baby, still in her womb, leaps inside of her. Unborn John the Baptist is filled with the Holy Ghost, just as the angel Gabriel had promised. Of course, we know that Jesus is a special baby, but let's not forget, John is a pretty special fellow too. At this point, John is just an unborn baby. Yet this unborn baby knows something. He knows something. What does John know as a fetus that many grown men miss? John somehow knows from inside the darkness of his own mother's womb that he is in the presence of Christ, the Messiah, and his Savior. At this mo moment, you know, if you calculate all this out, John is, I should say Elizabeth is in the beginning of her third trimester. So John is six months along. Jesus, or Mary, is in the beginning of the first. He's just brand new in the womb. Yet they are seemingly conscious of each other. That's amazing to me. Can someone again tell me how that which lives in the womb is insignificant? It isn't. It's marvelous and somehow knowing. John sees the truth about Jesus at this very early stage. Somehow he can see, he can sense. John just can tell that he is in the same room with the beginnings of Jesus Christ, the Savior of this world. Ladies and gentlemen, the Holy Spirit allows us to see what others cannot. The Holy Spirit allows us to feel what others cannot feel. Don't forget that Gabriel declared that the unborn baby John would be filled with the Holy Ghost even in the womb. Oh, if only the world could see through the undeveloped eyes of baby John the Baptist. Many people today have 20-20 vision. We have, we have eye surgery, Lasix. We have eyeglasses, binoculars, telescopes, and microscopes. Yet many people cannot see what is just in front of them. They cannot see what is here, what is around them, what is there. Around us, in a, is, a, around us is a world with only one hope. And that hope is Jesus Christ. Unborn John seems to know stuff. I wonder if unborn Jesus knows stuff too. Being only in the first trimester at the very beginnings of the stage of life, some say that Jesus couldn't see anything. I'm sure that's probably true. They, some say he wouldn't know anything at this stage. And maybe they're right. 
But Jesus isn't just any fetus. He may be tiny and undeveloped, but he is still the son of God. An unborn babe in the womb, even as a, a newborn babe in, in a manger, did he know he was the son of God? Or did he just know goo goo gaga, like we think babies know? You know, Hebrews 13, 8 does tell us that Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, perhaps undeveloped baby Jesus did know of his importance, or perhaps he knew very little at all. We just don't know, we're not told. But anyhow, at this time, Mary is engaged to a man named Joseph. Soon after her return from her visit with Elizabeth, Joseph finds out about Mary's condition. You know, a, a girl can only hide something like this for so long. Joseph can draw no other conclusion than to assume Mary has been unfaithful to him. After all, he's never been with Mary in this sense. To put it bluntly, she leaves town for a few months. She comes back a little heavier around the, the midsection. I mean, come on, that is suspicious. We can assume Joseph is going to be angry. At the very least, he's going to be disappointed with Mary in her supposed unfaithfulness. What will Joseph do? Well, we'll cover Joseph's story next week. point I'm going to invite Marcia Kalp to the pulpit and uh, for her Christmas reading and the candle lighting. Our Christmas on this second week of the Advent season is the cross crosslet. The large cross with four smaller crosses in each corner is a reminder to all Christians to share the good news to the four corners of the earth. Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20 is a command from Jesus saying, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, 
even unto the end of the world. Christians in the world follow this command by teaching the lost, preparing for his coming. As the first candle of hope and expectation shimmers to life, let us remember the unity we share as a Christian family. As the second candle, the candle of faith and preparation is lit, let us be faithful and prepare the world by spreading God's word. Thank you, Marcia. Let's take our hymnals and turn to page number 185, Away in a Manger. Page number 185. laid down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes. The little Lord Jesus no crying he makes. I love Lord Jesus. Look down from the sky and stay by my side until morning is nigh. Be near me, Lord Jesus, I ask thee to stay close by me forever and love me. I pray, bless all dear children in thy tender care, and lift us to heaven to live with thee there. Amen. It's a very sweet song. In many churches, the four Sundays leading up to Christmas Day is known as the Advent season. The Advent season was created to help us prepare our hearts for the celebration of the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Last Sunday was the first day of this season. We explored the hope that the birth of the Savior brought to this world. This week's Advent lesson is on peace. Uh, what is peace? You would think that the concept of peace would be universal. I mean, you would think that everyone would have the same vision, the same idea of what peace is. And I'm here to tell you that there are actually varying ideas from one person to the next of the concept of peace. And I've told you this before. I'm going to tell, you to, I'm going to tell it to you again because it's really funny. My parents are a great example of this. My parents had very opposing views of what peace meant. To my mother, peace was absolute quiet. My mother hated, simply hated unnecessary noise. She loved silence. She used to call it confusion, right? Tell them I'm lying. She'd say, oh, I don't like confusion. She hated any sort of unnecessary noise. She loved silence. There may be people here today that can agree with this. I mean, we often use these words with each other. We'll, we'll often say, I just need a little peace and quiet. To my mother, peace was the absence of noise. To my father, peace was the absence of my mother. Tell them I'm lying. No. <laughs> Seriously, to my father, peace was having a song in your heart, and some of you can relate to this. But lots of times, that song in my father's heart would make it up his throat and come out his lips. And my father loved especially humming and singing nonsensical songs. I knew he was at the most peaceful when he would sing, La-da-da-da-da, take me back to Tulsa, I'm too young to marry. 
Or he would say, Hallelujah, I'm a bum. Hallelujah, amen. And these would just come out when he felt best, when he felt peaceful. So you can imagine my mother's peace and my father's peace very often clashed. They would be riding in a car together, feeling at peace. My father would sing, who's that knocking at my door? It's Barnacle Bill, the sailor man. And my mother would ask, must you sing? The two could never be at peace in the same place at the same time. Now, my idea of peace is a little bit different than my parents. I, I feel the most at peace, the most tranquil, when I, have, when I have dealt with to completion something that has been hanging over my head. Perhaps a few of you can relate to this. When I have a deadline, it causes me strife. But when I deal with it, when I meet that deadline, when I put that task behind me, the strife I felt goes away and I experience the greatest sense of peace. The task is done. Ah. And I feel this every week. You know, with the coming week, you know, right now at 1130-ish today, um, when my task is done, I, I, I got the bulletin done, I got my lessons done, I preached them three times on three different services, and at 1130, ah, I'm at peace. But then it starts all over again, and I'll, I'll have to do this. I'll have another deadline for next Sunday. But anyway, let me get to the point. The idea of peace is not as universal as we might immediately think. Some might think of peace as uh, a good night's sleep. Others might think of peace as a good laugh, a good hearty laugh. Others might think of peace in the context of keeping law and order in our society so that we don't have to worry about going outside. Others might think of peace as the absence of war. Our ideas of peace can very often oppose each other too. Some might think that peace comes from everyone, when everyone is just allowed to do their own thing and, think, and, and voice their own opinions and to express their own individuality. And everyone just goes their different ways. Still others might think the exact opposite. Peace comes from conforming to one ideal, to one unified purpose. The concept of peace is varying. But no matter how you describe your ultimate peace, we can all agree that peace is a good thing, it is a good feeling, and it is, it is desired by all. I'm naive enough to think that many even go to war so they can eventually arrive at peace. Let me bring this into the real, reality of Christianity. Peace is good, God is good, therefore God is peace. How does God deliver his peace to us? Well, he does so through his Son. The angels declared at the night to the shepherds the night Jesus was born and, it, and the Bible says and suddenly there was with an angel the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace peace goodwill toward men how did the baby boy born of a virgin placed in a manger bring peace well the book of Colossians tells us for it pleased the father that in him should all fullness dwell and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Some of us may think of peace as silence. Some of us may think of peace as singing. Some may think of peace as lawfulness. Some may think of peace as unity or conformity. And these definitions are all valid. But what really matters is how does God define peace? And God defines peace as reconciliation. The Bible says, having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself and you that were sometimes alienated, yet now he hath he reconciled. What is reconciliation? Well, reconciliation is a reunion, a reuniting of two parties who were once at odds with one another. Maybe you've had a brother or sister who you've not talked to in years and one day you just both decide to bury the hatchet. That is peace. And that's what, how God defines peace. We need to be reconciled with God in order to have peace. When the angels announced on earth peace, they were offering Jesus as a peace treaty, an armistice, a truce between two war warring factions, that being God and mankind. God knew that in order for us to have peace with him, Jesus would have to be born to this earth and later die for mankind. I took the word peace and I made an acronym with it, just like I did last week. Peace to me is perfect existence at Christ's expense. 
in order for us to have find peace, in order for us to be reconciled with God, in order for us to go to heaven, in order for us, for us to have a perfect existence, Jesus Christ would need to be sacrificed. Ladies and gentlemen, we can each have a piece of that peace. If we want peace, if we want to one day have a perfect existence, we must do so at Christ's expense. There is no other way to have true everlasting peace. There is no other way to heaven. There is no other way to be reconciled with God than through the expense of his de son's death on that cross and his resurrection from the tomb. Please stand if you're able and comfortable standing. We'll have our communion reading. And then afterward, we're going to have an organ solo. Our communion reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22. And I'll begin. Of course, we're talking about Jesus here. And he took bread and gave unto them, saying, This do in remembrance of me. This cup is the New Testament in my blood. And you may be seated. <laughs> Please stand if you're able and comfortable standing. We will sing one verse of Bless me the tie that binds, and then we'll, we will close with the Lord's Prayer. Blessed be he the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship ship of kindred minds is like to that above. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And amen to you. Thank you for coming. You are dismissed. Merry Christmas. <laughs>